you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. Today I'd like to talk to you about the cross of forgiveness. The cross of forgiveness. You know, uh, I can't speak on the cross or you know, even study the cross without thinking about everything that the Lord went through for us. Uh, you know, he was on trial, and it was such a mockery trial. Uh, they called him names, they spit on him, they punched him in the face, uh, and then they, he took a beating that uh, many prisoners would uh, just die. They would literally die from the beating that he took. Uh, but he was Jesus, and he survived that, and he went to Calvary. And as I said earlier, folks, we can never thank God enough for sending Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins. And when we come to the Lord's Supper, I cannot say enough, uh, and words to me don't even do it justice on how much love He gave us, Jesus Christ gave us. Uh, he is the epitome of love. Uh, he never hurt anyone. He never was ugly to anyone. He had compassion on people. He loved people. Uh, he ministered to people. But yet, even uh, the Jewish leaders and the Jewish crowd uh, just hated him. You could see in all that was going on, even before the cross, how much hate was in these folks. So today, in looking at the cross, I want you to see the cross of forgiveness. And if you have a bulletin and would like to follow us uh, with that, uh, let me give you the outline. Number one, Jesus forgave his enemies. Jesus forgave his enemies. And folks, that's not easy to do. Okay, that's not easy to do. Number two, Jesus forgave a criminal. There were two criminals on that cross. Uh, and, and Jesus forgave one. And he would have forgiven the other. Uh, but because of his attitude and, and uh, just not understanding who Jesus was, he forgave a criminal. Number three, Jesus forgave me. This is where it comes in. And this is the personal part of it. And I understand what some people think. Well, I wasn't there. Well, folks, your sin was there. Because every sin that we will ever commit was laid upon Jesus Christ. So I pray you understand before you leave this place how important it is that we get the forgiveness of God in our life. Folks, I couldn't operate another day without forgiveness. God forgives me. When I am unlovable, He loves me. He forgives my sin. He is always there. He listens for my plead. He listens to our prayers. So I pray that you will see how important the cross of forgiveness is. I'd like to start in... Uh, verse 32, Luke 23, 32, Jesus forgave his enemies. There were also two, crim two others, crim criminals, led uh, with him to be put to death. They were treating him like a criminal. He was not a criminal. He was innocent of everything he was accused of. But he let it go. He let it go because he had a purpose he had a divine purpose in his life. And folks, he was born to die for the sins of the world. He wasn't a criminal. He was the perfect son of God. In verse 33, and when they had come to the place called Calvary, and uh, other translations say Golgotha, or even the place of the skulls, some people say that because uh, the place literally looked like a human skull, but the bottom line is, Calvary was a place of death. It was a place of death. There they crucified him. And the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. When I think about the forgiveness that Jesus showed these folks, he forgave the Roman soldiers who beat him. He forgave the people that mocked him. He forgave those who nailed, uh, put nails in his hands and his feet. He forgave those that punched him in the face, 
face and beat him with the cat of nine tails. Most of us, if not all of us, if we were treated the way Jesus was treated, we would not find forgiveness in us. But folks, Jesus was like no one else. Jesus was the only begotten, perfect Son of God. And Jesus lived up to what uh, He preached while He was here on earth. Turn, hold your finger there and turn with me to Matthew 5. Matthew chapter 5. We understand the Sermon on the Mount and we understood that there's several passages here that said, man says this, but Jesus or God says this. Folks, God's ways are not man's ways and man's ways in many ways are not God's. There was something uniquely different about Jesus. He saw potential in people. He loved people. He gave his life for people. And I still, it's hard for me to think of him being in perfect agony. I mean, you know, complete agony and hanging on the cross with blood dripping down with, uh, you know, the, the th crown of thorns on his head and blood falling on. And yet he says, Father, forgive them. And folks, that is what true forgiveness is. Look at verse 43 in Matthew chapter 5. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Folks, this is always have, has always gone on. You can see it in our world today. I'll love you. It's conditional love if you love me. I'll be nice to you if you're nice to me. But in our world today, there is just so much hate. So much hate. And I'm telling you, Jesus showed love to those that were mean to Him, to those that mocked Him, to those that were ugly to Him. You have heard it that was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy. Folks, Jesus showed agape love. Jesus showed unconditional love to His enemies. And I'm telling you, even today, folks, we have to dig down deep to do that. We have to understand that flesh and blood, okay, uh, you know, that's, that's not the issue that we have in life is with, with our fellow man. Our issue is between us and God. And the Bible tells in spiritual warfare uh, that these principalities and these powers are, you know, against us. And that was true even on the cross. But Jesus still forgave his enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Folks, Jesus had done nothing wrong. Nothing wrong. But yet, in his final moments, he forgave his enemies. He forgave his enemies. And today, folks, Jesus wants us to do the same. To do the same. To do what He would do. To follow Christ. To be that light to a dark world. To be that love to a world that hates. To be that Christian example. And folks, I know it's hard to do. I know... A lot of people say, but you don't know my story. But I know Jesus' story, folks. And you can do it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So we see the cross of forgiveness. Jesus loved his enemies. The second thing I want you to see is Jesus forgave a criminal. Look, in, look at the rest of that verse. Verse 34, and they divided his garments and cast lots. And again, this is a prophecy fulfilled from Psalm chapter 22. We knew by reading that this was going to take place. And folks, every prophecy, every prophecy that the, the prophets have said, folks, they have all come true. The Bible is an error. The Bible is perfect. The Bible is true from, from Genesis to Revelation. Verse 35, and the people stood looking on but even the rulers with him sneered, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ, 
the chosen of God. I've got news for that crowd, folks. He is and he was the Son of God. Even though he was on a cross, even though it seemed like he was defeated, he was the Son of God. And the word if there shows the lack of faith, the lack of understanding there. Hey, I love the song, Steve. He could have called 10,000 angels. He could have took care of everyone. In that courtroom, he could just mutter a prayer to God. He could just say, you, you saw the miracles that he, that he did, but he didn't do it because he had a purpose. He had a plan, and that plan was love. That plan was love. Verse 36, and the soldiers mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine. And some people think, well, they were being nice, and, and it could have been uh, you know, a thing of compassion. But I'm telling you, Jesus did not want, I, I mean, he, he wanted to feel the full effect of everything that went on. He didn't want this uh, deadening thing in his body. He was there. He knew what was going on. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, he knew how hard it was going to be. But yet, he followed through. Verse 36, the rest of 36, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. That was so all the folks, all the people in that area would know what this sign is. That this sign, and it says, this is the king of the Jews. Folks, I'm telling you, Jesus was the king. He is the king. He will always be the king. Even Pilate on trial kept trying to tell them, hey, you know, he has done nothing wrong. You have not shown me anything. They, they gave a criminal, Bar Barabbas. They said, man, forget Jesus. Give us Barabbas. But yet that love from the cross you could sense from Jesus Christ. He loved what we would call the unlovable. Then verse 39, then one of the criminals who uh, were hanged blasphemed him saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. The first criminal on the cross listened to what other people were saying. The first criminal on the cross was only thinking about himself. He did not recognize who Jesus was even though all these things happened even though he, he possibly could even have heard Jesus pre, uh, preach. And even Jesus' actions from the cross should have told him there's something different about this man. But this guy chose and chose not to believe. Not to believe. But the other answering rebuked him saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we, indeed, justly, for we, re we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. See, there were two types of criminals there. One who was only thinking about himself, and one who realized who Jesus was and what he did. Folks, these guys, the first two criminals, both deserve death. Jesus did not deserved death for his life. He had done nothing wrong. One denied Jesus Christ. One did not believe in Jesus Christ. One was only concerned about himself. And the other, in watching Jesus, in watching and listening to his words, there were seven phrases or seven passages of Scripture Jesus uh, uttered and said from the cross. And this criminal was listening to these things. And folks, I am telling you, this last part of this verse, but this man has done nothing wrong, that was a statement of faith. He believed in Jesus Christ. He believed that he was innocent. He saw a difference in Jesus Christ. He trusted in Christ alone for
or his salvation. And we know this because of the rest of these verses. Verse 42, and then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He understood for the first time what his kingdom was. He understood that Jesus didn't come to take over the Roman government. Jesus didn't come uh, to, to you know, uh, have war with, with the Romans or, or you know, take over. He wasn't doing that. He understood who Jesus was and what he was about. And I love verse 43. And Jesus said unto him, Assuredly, which means truly or truly, or you can count on it. I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now folks, this man went to heaven with Jesus Christ. This man found Jesus Christ. You talk about a deathbed conversion. He was going to die in a few hours, but yet God saved him. Folks, it tells me that it's never too late to invite Jesus Christ into your life. It's never too late to repent of your sins and make Jesus Lord of your life. You've never gone too far out there or sinned uh, too bad uh, that you can't come to Christ and be saved. And your greatest need today, folks, I'm telling you, is salvation. It is salvation. The Bible says in Romans 10, verse 13, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Folks, whoever is everyone. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter what you have on. It doesn't matter you know, how much income you have. Folks, Christ died for everyone. He forgave his enemies, as an example that we should do. He forgave a criminal, which shows that salvation is for everyone, that whosoever is everyone. And then the third thing I want you to see, Jesus forgave me. Well, folks, if you're here without Christ, you need the forgiveness of God in your life. The forgiveness is God, I'm telling you folks, is so, so important. So important. Look at verse 44. Now it was about the sixth hour, which would have been around noon, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Folks, the darkness showed uh, sin's nastiness. The darkness showed what Satan is. Satan is, is darkness. The darkness when Jesus was suffering on the cross uh, just hung over the cross because they had, uh, you know, cru they were crucifying an innocent man. It wasn't an eclipse. It wasn't a mix-up on the time of the day. Folks, our God can do anything He chooses to do. Then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. See, up to this point, it was the animal sacrifice that rolled back their sins for one year. It was the blood of animals that covered their sin. But now, folks, the veil of the temple was torn in two, and now we can go directly to the throne of God. We can speak to God. We can pray to God. We can talk to God. We can ask God for forgiveness. We don't have to go to man. Only God and Jesus can forgive sin. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Father, into your hands, folks. God and Jesus were one. God and Jesus were were joint together. God and Jesus, the communication was always open. God knew what Jesus was about and Jesus knew. And Jesus' whole purpose was do, to do the will of the Father. And you think of it at this point where during that darkness all the sin that we ever committed was put 
on Jesus Christ. He became sin for us. A man that's never sinned, never sinned, became sin for us. Folks, I hope you understand the depth of the love of Calvary. The depth of the love of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And, and His Spirit, folks, His body died. And as Phil has just saying, I'm telling you, He was crucified. He was dead. He was put in a tomb. And three days later, folks, we know He arose, which gives us everlasting life. We need to thank God for Calvary. We need to thank Jesus for dying for our sins. And having said this, he breathed his last. So when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God saying, certainly this was a righteous man. Well, folks, two soldiers there found Jesus Christ at Calvary. And I'm telling you today, I'm telling you today, you can find Jesus Christ at Calvary also. If you don't know Jesus Christ, we are going to have a time of invitation before we do the Lord's Supper. And I pray that you will come down, talk to us, Allow us to share some scripture with you and and you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ that when you die, you know you're going to heaven. That is your greatest need. But before that, I want to talk about one last thing and that is about the word forgiveness itself. Folks, I said earlier in the first point, it's really hard to forgive our enemies. I was pondering this about two weeks ago. And I was just looking ahead at what the cross meant and what was going on. And for Jesus to think about, you know, for Jesus to make that statement, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Folks, what they did to Jesus, that, I mean, nothing, nothing that I can think of is worse than what they did to Jesus. So if Jesus had the ability for, to forgive because Jesus is in our life as Christians, we can forgive others also. And so I was thinking about it, and folks, I am telling you, a lot of counseling, a lot of people that I have talked to, the biggest deal that they have is the lack of forgiveness. Okay, I would say somewhere around 60 to 65% of my counseling, when I got to thinking about this, it is an issue of a Christian not being able to forgive someone or even forgive God. I mean, folks, we shouldn't, we shouldn't even hold things over God. And I'm telling you, if we could come to the place of forgiveness in our lives, it will totally free us up. It will release that pain and that ache and that heartache in the past. Folks, Satan wants us to live in the past. Jesus forgave you when you were saved of everything in your past. And we as Christians need to forgive others. Period. Others. And folks, to take the Lord's Supper is a serious thing. And none of us are worthy of it. But folks, I pray that today there are Christians here that during our time of invitation will let it go. I don't know your situation. I don't know what's happened to you. I'm sure it was a terrible thing. But if you will forgive others, I am telling you, you will be healed emotionally and spiritually. You will. God will heal you. But that that bitterness that we have in our lives keeps us from being all that God wants us to be. So when we look at the cross of forgiveness, we need to forgive our enemies, we need to forgive those who have done us wrong, and we need to realize, God forgave me 
Matthew 6, and I close with this. Go to Matthew 6. Matthew 6, verse 14. And you know right before these verses is the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer. Verse 14. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men of their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Folks, to be free from bitterness, to be free from envy, to be free from this, this many things that crop up in our lives, we have to be willing to forgive others. We have to. And my prayer is, today, you'll do some business with God. You'll be doing some introspecting with God and realize, you know what? I need to forgive others. I need to forgive others. And folks, part of forgiving others is the same thing that God has done for you. God forgave you, so we should forgive others. Father, thank you for this day. And God, I thank you for this time that we have. And God, you're just an awesome God. And God, I can never repay. We can never repay you for what you did on the cross. God, the cross truly was an act of forgiveness. God, I pray that you would really help us to be able to forgive our enemies. God, I pray that we would even forgive ourselves, God. Sometimes I am my worst enemy. And God, I pray that today, right now, we would confess our sin. God, I pray that you would just do a work in our lives and folks could be free and God, I know, I know lots of folks have been in bad situations, but Satan wants to remind them of the past. And God, I pray they would just let it go. God, thank you for your blood. Thank you for shedding your blood for all of us. Thank you, Lord, for just your body and it was beaten and broken for us. Thank you that Lord, we'll just prepare our hearts right now for the Lord's Supper. God, I pray that we would just tune everything out. Everything. And God, I pray that we would remember the cross. God, this is your church. This is your invitation. God, I pray you do with it what you choose. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come? We thank you for joining us this morning at Rye Hill Baptist Church, and may God richly bless you.